and I think as well when you when you read or watch something yourself, there's always something in there that really inspires you to in some sort of way. And so I think it's really important now to be offering more inspirational fiction because I'm definitely seeing a, a different group coming out from the young and new adults. They're, they're, they're wanting a whole lot more and, and different things and different material um, to what has been quite stereotypical for many decades. So, you know, they all have their own place, but I think the inspirational fiction is a great way to inspire people through storytelling, you know, without actually putting it in, in people's faces. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 235 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Annalise Morgan, uh, who's an author, a traveler, and a solo mom of two boys. She is also an award-winning advanced veterinary surgical nurse, and it was through this vocation that she returned to her passion for creativity and writing. We'll talk about that, her book Stay Wild, her passion for inspiring young adults and young readers, and so much more. And that's coming up later in this episode, but first, let's hear a word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Find A Way Voices. Find A Way Voices offers authors an opportunity to get their audiobooks out into a global market with more than 43 retail and library channels that you can have access to. And it's not an all-in if you don't want to. You can use Find A Way Voices to pick and select which platforms you want to publish your audiobooks to. You can look for a narrator through Find A Way Voices if you're looking for one. They have a marketplace as well as a sort of a more guided process with a project manager internally there. Or you can upload your own audiobook if you, for example, like me, may have deals uh, with audiobook narrators. So you can just upload it, set your price. And yeah, set your price. That's a cool, cool feature related to Find A Way Voices. You can set your price which you can't do on Audible. Uh, so with Findaway Voices, you can publish to Audible, but that's the only spot you can't really publish your price to. You can control your price on multiple platforms. And speaking of pricing, I did an awesome Chirp audiobook promo through Findaway Voices, and the only way you can get, get into Chirp, which is owned by BookBub, is through Findaway. I had a fantastic deal. Ended up moving more than 1,008 hundred audiobooks, uh, four audiobooks in my, actually five technically, <laughs> four audiobooks in a short story in my Canadian werewolf series. And uh, basically, um, in just the in just the five weeks of, of the promo, and it was like a four week promo, plus just sort of a bit of a tail on because even after, even after my trip deal ended, I'm still selling uh, copies, I still, uh, the trip deal ended, I believe it was on the fourth or the or the fifth, and I still sold, now not, not a significant amount of titles, I think I sold a dozen titles in that time period, but um, that's a lot more titles than the none that I sold in the previous several weeks. So a great opportunity for authors through Findaway Voices is access to promotions like through Chirp. But that's just one of the things you can do with Findaway Voices. There's plenty, plenty more, and if you want to Check out how you can leverage Find Away Voices as an author to take control of your audiobook empire. You can look no further than starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Okay, so a bit of a personal update. Uh, last week, uh, the week of February, what was that? I'm um, looking at the calendar, 6th through 12th, or, or 13th technically, 6th through 13th, that's seven full days. Uh, I was in Colorado Springs, Colorado, at the Antlers Wyndham Hotel. The Antlers is a beautiful 
historic hotel that um, looks looks upon the beautiful Pikes Peak and so many of the gorgeous mountains that surround uh, Colorado Springs. And I was there for Superstars Writing Seminars. That's superstarswriting.com if you want to check that out. Now, I've been a speaker there for 10 years now. This is the 12th annual uh, or 12th of Superstars. Uh, it was canceled last year. And I uh, became co-director um, in, in the last year, meaning uh, I'm working with Marie Whitaker, a good friend and, um, and previous uh, director, solo director, now co-director, as I'm learning bit and bit, bits and pieces from Marie. And uh, that has been such a phenomenal conference. So I flew out Sunday so that I could be there Monday for the first meeting that we had. And then I flew back Sunday. So it was, you know, getting into Colorado Springs, you know, 10 o'clock at night on the Sunday and then leaving and getting home close to midnight on the following Sunday. So this was the largest superstars. I think there was 260 people there in person. Would have been well over 300 had it not been for the pandemic. A lot of people were unable to attend. So for example, Tara Kremen, uh, my former colleague and the director of uh, Kobo Writing Life or at Kobo, uh, Kobo was a sponsor, so was Draft to Digital, so was Book Funnel, uh, so so many so many great sponsors. But uh, Tara was not able to make it, but um, Kobo still sponsored, so uh, we got to draw uh, a winner uh, for um, a Kobo device, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, many folks were not able to attend, but that's okay. Um, many people still did attend, and and again, you know, coming from Canada, going to the U.S., bit of a challenge. Had to get my uh, you know, within 20, I think it was 24 hours to, to leave Canada to go to the States. I had to have a, a COVID test. So I did that at uh, Shoppers Drug Mart here in Ontario. And then coming back, uh, it was within 72 hours I had to have a PCR test um, to, so I could fly back to Canada. And uh, fortunately, the state of Colorado had set it up. There was a UC Health that created an account. I had to use the address of the hotel because I couldn't put in a Canadian address. Uh, I, I took a cab, went out, it was a drive through test, and I got my test results back in about 14, 15 hours, although it was, you know, 24 to 48. So I did that on Friday because I was flying out um, Sunday uh, noonish. Um, so, so those are still the challenges of travel. And, and of course, the fact that I have been living in a lockdown province where no one gatherings in person, I think we got up to 10 people and, and it was brought back down and you couldn't get can't get into a restaurant without showing your vaccination status and wearing a mask inside at all times so like my visit to vegas there's a lot of culture shock for me to go to colorado where it's kind of like free willy man like you just hey everyone lick everyone else's eyeballs so uh, again that comes with anxiety so not only was i at an elevation more than a mile high so the oxygen is thinner so you're having a little bit of trouble breathing if you're a if you're a a lowlander like myself but um I, it's great for alcohol i don't have to drink as many beers to to catch a buzz but um but, you know, i was a little bit anxious uh, a little bit anxious um about that so I, I wore a mask most of the time of course i was not wearing a mask when i was having lunches and dinners with people because you know you can't it's hard to eat with a mask on right you could put pushing food through the mask is a little difficult and of course uh, one of the places you'll always find me at a writer's conference is uh, at the bar. And and so obviously uh, when I was at the bar at night, I, I had my mask off uh, as well. So knock on wood, it is February 17th. I have tested three times since I've gotten back home. Uh, and so far, negative. Uh, I did not uh, pick anything up, but I'm going to be testing every couple days just because I think that's the right thing to do. But I do have to say... The last Superstars Writing Seminars I was at was in uh, 2020. It was, so it was February 2020. It was just before the lockdown. And it was only two years, right? We skipped a year. But oh my God, I was overwhelmed. It was a very emotional reunion. It honestly felt like a half dozen years. I love these people. Uh, they are so amazing. It was so amazing to be back with my tribe, my family, um, and, and again, it was larger than ever before. 40% of the attendees were uh, new to Superstars. So it was so wonderful to welcome in new people. Obviously, it was very emotional because um, our, our dear friend uh, and one of the founders of Superstars, uh, Dave Farland, Dave Wolverton, 
Uh, his real name was uh, Dave Wolverton, but he, he wrote under Dave Farland and, and was known by both, of course. Uh, and he passed away just a few weeks ago. And so uh, there was a lot of emotion uh, related to lost friends, but it was such a wonderful reunion of so many of the people I just so, so adore, so love, so respect and admire. Uh, just great to hang out. Um, and yes, of course, it's a conference, so there's learning, <laughs> there's presentations and panels and discussions and and so many great conversations with people in the hallway. So many great authors. I got an opportunity to chat with one-on-one. -on -one. So many new people I'd, I've never met before that I had a chance to meet and connect with. And uh, as always, it's just such a it's such a privilege and an honor uh, to get to do these things. And I really, oh my God, do I ever miss hugging people. I, uh, I may have broken some ribs of some uh, dear friends of mine <laughs> as I squeezed them tight. Uh, but I was uh, very, very uh, huggy and so, so glad. Um, I mean, the power of a hug. Let, let's think about that for a second. The, the, the amazing thing about a hug is you are both giving and receiving at the same time. And it's a real, there's a real connection that you can make with a, a friend when you just hold them, when you just give them a tight hug. And, uh, and, you know, male or female, it doesn't matter to me. I love hugs. Uh, so many, so many great hugs from so many wonderful people that just, just warmed my heart and lifted my spirit. And I really, really needed that. And, and that's why uh, for the, the patron roundtable uh, that we'll be recording this coming Sunday, I want to talk about that importance of the um, maybe it's more of a tactile, and, and, and maybe we can relate this to, to uh, books and reading, is that yes, ebooks and digital are great, but there's nothing like that tactile experience. And, and that's what a hug is. Yeah, I can, I can connect with you digitally, we can have a chat, we can do Zoom, we can do whatever it is. We can connect in all these beautiful ways that allow us to stay connected as human beings. But the tactile experience of shaking someone's hand, of giving them a hug, of seeing them and seeing their faces when you're speaking to them directly right there, just, you know, a few feet or whatever it is away is, is, is quite an interesting experience. Just like that ta tactile experience of picking up a book and so many of the books that, you know, people sign to me. Yeah, I, re I read your book in an ebook, but I want a physical copy. So uh, Travis Hearman, for example, uh, T. James Logan, he writes uh, one of the names he writes under, and, and I just read his wonderful werewolf uh, lycanthrope uh, series, uh, two of the three books in the trilogy that he has out. And, and uh, it's a YA series. I absolutely love them. I listen to the audiobooks, but uh, I bought copies uh, of them because I wanted, I wanted to own them. I wanted to hold them. I also wanted to hold them up in Instagram shots and show people, hey, look, check out these books. <laughs> because it's really hard to hold up my phone and show you the cover of the audiobook that I was listening to. So, so again, uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm overwhelmed and still, come on, it's several days. It's, it's how many days? Five days ago I got back from this and I'm still overwhelmed and enthusiastic. Well, that of course is because we're all, we're doing the postmortem we got surveys coming in. People are still chatting uh, on the Facebook group for Superstars Writing Seminars. And, uh, and of course, uh, Marie and I uh, and so many of the other people involved are, are working on planning out next year's conference. Uh, but yeah, it was a really uplifting, a really powerful week for me. I'm probably still going to be digesting things. Uh, I do have to say, um, and this is my, 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 my friend James A. Owen, who's one of the founders of Superstars Writing Seminars. He does an amazing Drawing Out the Dragons talk, which is absolutely phenomenal. I've, I've seen it uh, probably 10 times in person. I have uh, read the book twice and listened to the audiobook numerous times. It's always motivational. It's always inspiring. And of course, at the very end of the Drawing Out the Dragons, James did the blindfold and he was going to attempt to draw a dragon because he draws a dragon as part of it and, and basically says it starts with four lines. And they're very deliberately chosen and that's how you draw a dragon. And, it, and it's just a mo it, it's basically it's a metaphor for life and writing and creativity and passion. And so he did one, uh, he did a, a right-handed uh, dra dragon, uh, he did a left-handed dragon, um, you know, basically saying you can, you can use the 
do the same lines just in a different way. And then he uh, he did one blindfold and he turned the easel around, uh, had had a help an assistant uh, blindfold him, and then he was to draw a dragon blind. Of course, he tricked us all. And uh, when he turned the easel around, he left the blindfold on, and instead of a dragon, it said, "Will you marry me, Helen?" And uh, that's uh, the, his girlfriend, uh, Helen. And <laughs> and then he put his hand out, had the blindfold on, and uh, and of course Helen ran down the aisle, uh, took his hand, and said yes. And I thought, damn, that was beautiful. I'm getting choked up just just thinking about that. Um, particularly uh, because <laughs> when my marriage uh, ended and I was down in the dumps, uh, I remember uh, I didn't tell a lot of people initially. I told James about it at uh, Superstars one year. Uh, and then he got to sort of hear about how I met Liz and how everything was wonderful and uh, and he admitted to me that uh, he had also, um, his marriage had also um, uh, ended. Uh, and again, both of us have great respect uh, for our, our ex-wives, uh, the mother of our children. And so we, we had that in common, but we had also found, <laughs> he got to meet Liz one year when she came out, and I got to meet Helen and I think I might have broken her ribs when I hugged her the first time I met her because uh, it was so lovely. And then, uh, but I, I did, I did say this to him afterwards when I gave him a big giant hug and said, "I love you, my brother." Uh, I said, "Damn you!" I thought I had a really good, I thought I had a really good proposal story. Now, damn it, you just proposed in front of two hundred and fifty of your best friends. <laughs> so, uh, man, I'm gonna have to repropose to Liz or something. No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just teasing. Uh, obviously, uh, Liz and I have a really cool uh, engagement story, but so does my awesome friend James, and and so does the awesome uh, Helen, uh, and so that was just part of uh, part of the emotions was um, you know a memorial for a, a, a beloved friend who we lost, but also a celebration uh, of another friend who is uh, is turning a new chapter in his life. But um, this is the rambling openings of my personal update. I did not get a lot of writing done, but I got a heck of a lot inspi of inspiring done. <laughs> and, uh, and I got to turn that into, channel that into writing because I have a lot of projects on the go and a lot of things to work on. So um, that's it for the introductory bit uh, to this episode. Why don't we get into the interview with Annalise Morgan, which is coming up right after this stinger. Annalise, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Thank you for asking me. I'm very excited about it. I'm uh, really excited to get to talk to you. I'm really excited to get to talk to you about your writing, what you're writing now. But mm. uh, to get to that point, we should give our listeners a bit of a backstory as to your background story and how you got into writing in the first place. D yes, it's, it's quite interesting because it's quite different, I, I feel, to, to, to a lot, lot of people. And it, and it began back in the late 90s, uh, 97, 98, 99, somewhere, somewhere around there. Right. And I was always very creative when I looked back as a teen, but I ended up in the veterinary profession okay. and became a, a, a veterinary nurse and then became an advanced surgical diploma um, veterinary nurse. I ran the, the practices and, and the nursing teams and, and the standards and so on. And I absolutely, and, and I loved what I did. I, I absolutely right. loved what I did. And somewhere in between all of all of this um one of and one of the things I was very much interested in which was part of the practice I worked for they specialized in, uh, in anesthesia and I became very very interested in that topic yeah. and critical care and surgery was another one of my my uh, fascinations and I, I, I got asked to co-write um, a new book for the veterinary nurses with one of the veterinary surgeons about anesthesia. And he asked me to co-write this book with him. Um, at this point, the whole writing thing, it just sort of flew over my head in, in some respects because I was just more excited about being able to impart the knowledge I had right. to help the other nurses, et cetera, with their, with their studies. 
So I wrote this and didn't think anything more about it. And then it might have been a year later, something uh, along those lines, a, a publishing company who publish books for human doctors and dentists were branching out into the veterinary market and were researching the viability of, of this and could I help this lady with the research because I'd done this other book. So I did, <laughs> again, didn't think anything more about it. They then phoned up a few months later and said, look, do you want to write these books? And it was sort of, there was two, three books there very quick. And so this is how it all came in. And 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 then um, when when I look back, I think it's, it, it, I think if you're a, a born writer and author and, and just a, a, an entertainer in that sense, it finds you wherever you are, even if you've kind of veered off from it for a little while, you know, and it found right. me back in that, that way. And then I ended up writing a lot of pet care articles and that then turned into more of my own voice, not just veterinary academia textbooks for the students, right. but then pet care books for owners and and then sort of blogs I started my own blog I created Desperate House Pets and um that was a, a book a blog it created a reality tv show which nearly went all the way but didn't unfortunately wow um, <laughs> and so that became a thing and 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 then I was getting I was people were becoming more and more interested sort of in my own background my own story and becoming quite inspired by that so I then broke into sort of writing more inspirational autobiographical pieces, blogs and series, you know, I, I put these up all on, on the internet. And so for years, I sort of cracked at it through through that way whilst working and writing through the nights and single parent as well. And so, so yeah, so that's where the veterinary aspect comes, comes from. It sort of was the springboard to get me back in, into it. Wow. So how did you migrate from nonfiction you know, uh, informational entertainment, uh, biographical pieces. How did you migrate that into uh, fiction? It, it's been an interesting journey, there's that, over the last few years, because it's, I, which, I, and I think it's, it's kind of known quite to be quite difficult to, to make that, that manoeuvre. And it's, I've done, it's been done very slowly as well, you know, because right. I think you have to really learn who you are as a person and what you're yeah. wanting to do and, and the, the genres and just the, t the type of thing you, you, you want. So it's become very, I've done it gradually. And I think it sort of reached a point because the, the nonfiction side wasn't, it, it felt it finished its cycle. You know, I've done it for, for, for many, many years, loved it. And then all of a sudden it was like not feeling like it quite fitted. And but all of my knowledge and all of my know-how and, and it was all non-fiction, which as we know is very different to writing yeah, fiction. Yeah. Um, so I had to sit for quite a while and figure out what is it I actually really in, enjoy. I, I started to look back down through the abyss of, as to <laughs> what I used to read as a child and a teen. And then there was that whole thing, I can't possibly write that. I, I can't <laughs> write that. That's for like proper people, you know, proper author, you know, I, I, um, this is so, and then eventually I thought, no, actually, I, I really want to. So then I started to learn a bit more about how fiction is, is written. And all of a sudden it was just like, yeah, I, I love this. So it's, it's been slow. It's, you know, it still is, um, you know, it's always a learning curve, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so what, what inspired you then when you, when you were looking at the things that you enjoyed reading or, or was it? looking at the things you enjoyed reading, et cetera, that you decided to write for, you know, young adults, new adults, et cetera? I think because, um, and again, I think this comes back to really knowing who you are as a person and doing that sort of um, work and looking at why you want to do something. And by this point, um, I'd, I'd had quite a traumatic past as growing up and then in, in my 30s as well, various big traumas. And when when I look back and then I've, I've two uh, boys as well who were, you know, 14 and 21 now, but they'll always be 10 years old. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> but it, we've been, the th you know, it's been the three of us and, and we've been like the three musketeers. We're like best friends. 
Oh. And so it gave me a very different insight into the young adults world. Right. Um, and I've, with the age gap, I've got the, the two different uh, ends of that, that scale. And so it gave me a very different insights in, into that. And I became friends with them, friends with their friends. And, and I thought, gosh, a, a lot of the stuff that I've been through as well can then be incorporated into the into the the, the fiction side of things. Right. Um, and when I looked back at what I really liked, it was all sort of a bit more of the fancy type thing or the fairy tales or the, the magic. Um, and once I got over myself that I should not write such a thing, um, that's, and what, cause I, I started to look at not only what I read, but what I watched on TV, what I watched on films, um, just the type of even art and things like that I would look at. And I also realized at this, at this point, I was watching a lot of young adult, new adult stuff on Netflix, you know, like the college shows and the high school shows. Absolutely love those. <laughs> and I thought, hang on, there's some, there's a reason why, you know, I'm, at that point was 40 years old. I thought, why is a 40 year old woman watching high school and college shows you know yeah. so yeah it was it was learning it was finding all these little bits and then it's like ah yeah that's the big okay. you know piece of the puzzle <laughs> so your first novel um stay wild yeah tell us about the book what's the premise who's who's the main character the it's a young adult uh, urban fantasy set in london and the main character is a young girl called Seven Madison. She's 16. And they're in there, her and there's a group of friends, the seven of them, the British and American friends. And they're, they're at high school in, in London. And it's where she, she's desperate to be what she wants to be. And she, within that, she comes, um, uh, she stumbles and finds a, this that everyone has this generational curse from like 200 years ago that's affecting all of their minds to, to uh, keep them bound to sort of the, the bad force um, called the Boras. Okay. Um, and so the only way to, but there's only way, you know, she, she learns she's a, a, these supernatural characters, half supernatural magicians type and half human. And they're the ones who can break the curse for their individual family and it's it's speaking to a lot of the the generational uh, uh, issues and but they've they've all got psychic powers magical all the different sort of esp type ones so she becomes a zepho and has to go on a coded mystical quest with finding other zephos as well and eventually if they beat the quest then the curse is rid of their family lineage for, for for that time but she ends up in a in a pickle with mafia and the London street gang and um, so it gets quite interesting as well but I try and keep it quite real at the same time right is it set in, in modern London then yes yeah modern day yeah yeah okay and then and so this is book one in the series you have plans for more uh, yes, I will be moving. I'm just finishing up something else at the minute and then I'll be moving on to, to book two. I had just planned a book one and a book two, but we'll we'll see um, right. what happens. <laughs> see what reader demand is. Okay. Yeah, that, well, exactly. Yes. <laughs> and then uh, so Black Daisy Press. Yes. Uh, it's published by Black Daisy Press. Um, yes. How did Black Daisy Press come about? Now, again, this is fairly fledging, so it looks like it's, you know, quite bare at the moment, but by hopefully towards the end of the year, that will it will look a, uh, quite different. And again, this comes back to that I've got such a passion for the young and new adults, um, which is linked to my own stories, you know, but I love the young and new adults, and I think they get a really hard time as well you know the, so much especially the teenagers they're, they're almost treated as second-class citizens or a problem a lot of the time and I don't believe that uh, at all and so I wanted to create the, uh, the media books um, and, and a whole 
specifically aimed at the young and new adults. So it's not just Black Daisy Press publishing books and, and other things. It's a Black Daisy world and oh. it will become a world for the young and new, new adults, um, which I'm very excited about d- doing for them. And I was just listening as well to your previous podcast about the trends for 2022 and, and the the digital side of things, which I think is also really important. Um, so it's it's creating a very edgy, relatable, cool experience. I'm quite old school in a lot of ways, but I think, you know, I like to speak to their hearts. So I, I, I do that. Uh, okay. Hopefully by being myself and creating this world of entertainment for them. Well, that's interesting. I, I like that you're thinking uh, beyond just the books that it's some um, uh, overall mm-hmm. experience. Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely um, uh, what, you know, that's what I'm trying, trying to create now. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting. Um, uh, you, you've mentioned uh, inspirational fiction uh, in our previous correspondence. And, yeah. and what, what, what is the importance of inspirational fiction? And, and why is that something that you've wanted to include? I, I think... I, I see things turning um, slightly, again, I'm, I'm speaking specifically on the young and new adult side, but again, I think in the, in the 40s and 50s age groups um, as well, and people are, are, are looking for reasons why um, about a lot of things, or understanding a lot of things, um, or might be searching for, for, for that, but don't, don't necessarily know they are. Um, and I think as well, when you, when you read or watch something yourself, there's always something in there that really inspires you to, in some sort of way. And so I think it's really important now to be offering more inspirational fiction, because I'm definitely seeing um, a, a different group coming out from the young and new adults. They're, they're, they're wanting a whole lot more and, and different things and different material um, to what has been quite stereotypical for many decades. So, but, you know, they all have their own place, but I think the inspirational fiction is a great way to inspire people through storytelling, you know, without actually putting it in, in people's faces. I often think of, um, there was an old, decades ago, the Prime Minister of uh, the UK a lady called Margaret Thatcher quite quite a lot of people didn't didn't like her but the the um she she had a great quote with that which said being powerful is much being like a lady if you have to say you are you're not and I think <laughs> it's the same <laughs> with you know we hear a lot of people say no oh, they're inspiring I'm an inspiring role model but I think if you have to say that it changes the dynamic of it a little bit. So I think you can do, you can inspire people through your fiction, but without it being so, you know, um, so, so loud. I think that belongs in the nonfiction. I love that quote. It is something <laughs> I've often said uh, in referring to vanity publishers who yes. have to on their website say, we are a real publisher. And it's like, you know, Harper Collins does not have to call themselves a real publisher for people no. to understand they're a real publisher. Uh, yes. Random House Penguin, they don't have to say they're a real publisher. Uh, it's like me think the lady doth protest too much situation, right? Okay. And, 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 and Margaret Thatcher did have that right. It's true. <laughs> if you have to say it, really. <laughs> exactly. You shouldn't. You, it should just start to come come across, um, you know, um, in, in the in the way that you were. And and if you're, why you're doing it is, is there um going back to what i was saying before then it will you know I, or i believe so anyway i'm reminded of more recent politicians who p- proudly boast and claim that they are the the thing the best the everything and, and i just shake my head and go well um maggie said something about that a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> See, I'm in Canada, so we have an affinity to uh, to things going on in the UK since we're 
kind of children. <laughs> oh yes, of course, of course. So you probably heard of it. Um, oh, we know, we know. I mean, it's it's our it's our mother country. Like we have the, the Queen, everything, right? Or even our Parliament system is based on uh, UK. We have a Prime Minister just like you guys do. Wow. <laughs> I've uh, never been to Canada. I'd, I'd love to go. Yeah, it's it's kind of like a little mini version of the the UK meets the US. It kind of like oh, this wow. weird <laughs> weird amalgamation. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> So do you still write nonfiction or is is most of your is most of what you're working on now focused on on the, the series and, and Black Daisy Press and, and that sort of realm? But most of it now is focused on 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 that. If I I might go back to nonfiction at some point from a, a, a memoir right. point of view. Okay. Um, I did try doing that not too long ago, but it just wasn't. Um, it just it wasn't working for me so I thought it's not the right time so I put that put that away I did last year did a couple of tiny little books mainly just as, as throughout the the lockdown and for me to practice certain skills which was right. all about the supernatural and mystical subjects oh, um, non-fiction though it, it was non-fiction but there were only little tiny books which I've um, started as a mailing list and I did them on, they're called the moon telegrams and every new moon I sent the subscribers a, 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 an email or a telegram because it was on the little vintage paper oh. and stuff, um, about a topic to do with the supernatural and, and sort of mystical elements, uh, non-fiction ones, because uh, I've studied a lot in those arenas. And and then by the end of it, I thought, oh, it's just really cool, you know. It's, I just I really like this this work. <laughs> so I put them into two little two little volumes, um, and I, it's it might be something I, I go back to, but it, uh, I'm definitely preferring sort of the fiction side and the work I want to do with Black Daisy Press as well. Right, I find that fascinating. But th th there there can be a tie in between the people who enjoyed that nonfiction supernatural stuff and potentially the world, right? Because if they're interested in supernatural paranormal That's magic true. maybe yeah. they could maybe they are right so are those things uh widely available like the the yes. non-fiction pieces yes they are they're, they're actually on my personal site Annalise Morgan okay. um the moon telegrams that, um I haven't put them on the Black Daisy one yet but yes they are available wide as uh, as well in print and digital excellent excellent thank you so I have to ask because Annalise Morgan sounds like the perfect pseudonym for uh, a writer of YA urban fantasy. <laughs> is Annalise Morgan a, a, a pseudonym, like a, a made up name, or is that actually your name? That's actually, no, it's actually my real name. Oh, wow. It was like you were born to write this genre. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yes. it's like just like a beautiful name. But oh, it seems you. just so on brand as well. So I had, I, that's why I was going to ask is, is all your other stuff under Annalise Morgan? Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, everything is under under my name. So, but yes, thank you for that. I've not really looked at it that way. I used yeah. to hate my name when I was younger. Oh, it was, really? No, I look at it and I think, wow, that I, I have to ask if that is a, a name that you picked because it perfectly matches your brand. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm glad I'm glad I was called it now. <laughs> there you go. It was like destiny. Um, yeah. It's like it's like there was this this magic in you all along, but it didn't come out until later in life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Isn't it always the way? <laughs> um, so the, I guess the, the, the next question I was going to ask was sort of related to go back to your uh, veterinary work is that mm -hmm. uh, well, obviously when writers have to research they uh, write their they have to go and research and look into things and if they're set in different locales they have to look them up have there ever been opportunities in your fiction so far where where you're <laughs> anything related to to animals that you're like oh I know that intimately I don't need to look it up or I mean mm -hmm. are the background characters who happen to be uh, you know work with work with animals vet, vets anything like that the the not at the moment I keep I keep thinking um I, I really should bring animals and and that side of things into it because I've got the perfect um background there to, yeah. to do it as well but yeah no I haven't as I haven't as, as, as I've had one or two ideas actually on on things recently but okay yeah. I was just curious to see if any of the people who enjoyed your blog or your previous work say, oh, my God, uh, this is so cool. <laughs> like trans oh, completely transitioning. It's very it's very difficult to judge because a lot of my audience say like on social media, they, they are lots of, probably a good portion of those 
began following me from the nonfiction um, right. years. Um, but they've stuck around. So, the, you know, and I do know for a few of them, they're now kind of very fascinated with, with, <laughs> with what I've done. And I think because I'm, I, I try to be quite open and genuine with things as well that right. um, they, they see that. So, yeah, it is, it's, you can, you can see it. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I love that. So what's some advice that you would want to give uh, either a younger self or to a beginning writer who's just wondering about getting into writing, whether it's nonfiction or fiction, any sort of advice that you think would be handy for them? I think believe in yourself quicker and sooner, for sure. Um, and um, that that definitely um, is one. I think if I'd have done that, I, I would have had a far easier time of things. And just decide. You know, I know we we hear a lot of people say, "I'm a I'm an aspiring writer. I'm an aspiring this and that." No, no, you're not. You 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 either are or you're not. You're one or the other. And um, so and and then with any decisions you 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 making just just decide i can i i'm you know could use my own advice here sometimes because i can sit and mull around on decisions for days going well shall i do this shall i do this and it's like just decide and pick one and 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 then you can always change course you know should you need to later on so i would i would say those two things get good at making decisions you know, and if you can't make big decisions, start with little ones, you know, decide what you're having for lunch and stick to it and work from there. Okay. And, and then believing in yourself so much sooner and quicker because that makes a, a whole world of difference. And find your why, why you're doing it, because that is the fuel that will do it. And, and it's not enough to say, you know, I, I, I want to be a, a, an author, a writer. It's like, why? And it's like, well, b- because I want to inspire people. I want to offer escapism or entertainment. Whatever. It's like, you've got to become like a five-year-old and keep asking why. It's like, well, why do you want to inspire people? Why do you want to offer escapism? And you keep asking that why, and eventually you'll land on your true one. And that can act as your north star then for for, for navigating you, you you through. But it's it's really anchoring down on that foundation and and just doing it. You if if you weren't meant to do it, you wouldn't have had the idea to do it in the first place. Right, right. Wow. Well, thank you for that. Now, can you please uh, share with my listeners where they can find you online? You had mentioned you had a author website. You also have the publisher website. Yes, they can find my site, which is annaliesemorgan.com, um, my books. There's, there is a page of archive books, books where all the veterinary stuff and other bits are, are on there. All the old blogs and things aren't there anymore, but uh, those are. And Black Daisy Press is blackdaisypress.com. It does, like I say, look bare bones at the moment, but it's uh, going to get there. And social media as well. I'm on um, Facebook and Instagram mainly. Um, so I'm on, on there a lot there. Annalise.Morgan, I think. Um, there's not too many Annalise Morgans, so <laughs> <laughs> too difficult to find. Awesome. Well, Annalise, thank you so much for spending the time to hang out with me today. No worries. Thank you for having me. I wanted to reflect on a couple of things that Annalise said uh, that kind of stuck with me, maybe particularly because where I was last week at Superstars Writing Seminars. The the first thing was, uh, in her advice to beginning writers is, uh, she said, you're not an inspiring writer, you're you're a writer. Um, And and I agree with her wholeheartedly. It's like, it's not a halfway thing. If if you're going to be a writer, you need to be a writer. You need to own it. This is something, uh, I did say this in a presentation that I gave on um, publishing pitfalls for authors at Superstars, and it's enough of this, I'm a wannabe writer, I'm an aspiring writer, is no, you are a writer. Whether or not you've had things published, you're serious, and I, and I address this to the people who are there, you paid a significant amount of money. You invested in yourself to be here to learn more about the business of writing and publishing. If you were here for craft day, you invested in the craft or whatever it is, but you've got to own that. And 
again, I'm going to harp back on what Annalise said and how it ties into, you know, where I spent uh, all of last week at Superstars Writing Seminars. And this is uh, James A. Owen, uh, who uh, is a dear friend and one of the founders of Superstars Writing Seminars. And he does an amazing, two amazing talks every year. Uh, one, uh, Drawing Out the Dragons, which I'm going to return to in a second. But the other one is the eggs benedict tale uh and he does an eggs benedict breakfast <laughs> uh several mornings uh during that which is a very inspiring breakfast and i would dilute of course the 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 way that james tells the story so brilliantly but at the end of the day it comes down to having to have faith and confidence and believing in yourself because you are uh not an inspire aspiring writer you are a writer and, and you can hold that title with pride. The, the other thing that Annalise says, and again, it brilliantly parallels with uh, something that James says in his Drawing Out the Dragons talk. And she, she, she says, if you can't make dis- big decisions, because they're harder, if you can't make big decisions, then make small ones. And, and I love that because you know, the, the big things can be scary, can be terrifying. You make the smaller ones. It's almost like what, what I used to do with my son Alexander when he was young is, you don't give him a choice when he's starting to figure out what he wants to wear himself, like dress himself. You don't give him the whole closet. You give him one or two choices so it's an easier decision so he can get used to the idea of making those choices. And then they can become easier. Then they can become, you can work your way up to them. But the other thing about that, and again, this is the parallel to what Annalise said in her advice and to what James says in his Drawing Out the Dragons talk, is that all your choices are cumulative. Uh, and, and again, in parallel, when she talks about, you know, when, when an idea comes to you and something like that came to you for a reason, and it's almost those things like I, when I think about how lucky I am as to where I am and how I got here, it wasn't because I did one thing, one big thing. I made a lot of small decisions along the way, and those decisions added up over time. Yeah, I made big decisions along the way too, but I also made a lot of small decisions, and those decisions over time added up and brought me to the place where I am and the decisions that you've made over time have added up over time and have brought you to where you are so it's okay to own them it's okay to own your mistakes too because sometimes the mistakes you made along the way helped inform you about that next step that next decision along the way so that's it for the reflection for this episode I hope you enjoyed episode 235 of the Stark Reflections podcast. I hope you enjoyed Annalise Morgan. There'll be a link to where you can find her online in the show notes over at starkreflections.ca. I want to pause and say a very special thank you to the patrons of the podcast. Thank you so much to my patrons for supporting this podcast over at patreon.com slash stark reflections and just a reminder that i have posted i'm doing a patron hangout a a reflective round table which is basically a live hangout with my patrons and that's going to be on sunday february 20th 2022 at 11 a.m eastern i am changing the time and day every month to give people in different time zones etc or different situations uh, a chance to to hang out And, and usually i think i've had four or five uh, folks uh, in the last couple months. And again, this is just a chance for us to hang out, for us to reflect. I'm probably going to be talking about, since I'm fresh back from this conference, that importance and just how amazing it was to be hanging out with people in person. But again, um, I'm open to questions that my patrons send in that we can talk about or uh, things that they bring up because it really is meant to be an open, reflective roundtable. So again, that is it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. If you like this podcast and you want to support this podcast, you do not have to become a patron, although I do love my patrons. Thanks again, patrons. You can leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice. Reviews really make a huge difference in helping other people discover podcasts because they're social proof that, you know, someone's actually listening and they actually care. I am also so ecstatic, uh, I should mention, uh, I, I got a chance to <laughs> chat with people who listen to this podcast, and I got a chance to hang out and chat with several of, of you folks at uh, Superstars Writing Seminars. Thanks for letting me know that also, hey, feeding the ego over here never hurts too, <laughs> but it is so great to 
to hear that I'm um, that you're listening and that you're getting uh, and that and that I was able to connect in person and and realize the the faces behind uh, all the awesome listeners because all I see are the stats and how many downloads I get. I just not sure who specifically. I mean, apart from. Uh, people who comment, etc., um, who's actually listening. So that's really, really important. But I'm rambling. That's what I'm doing right now. So I'm going to stop rambling. I'm going to get to the end of this, and I'm going to say thank you so much for listening to episode 235. And so, until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com. Right about then, a friend of mine showed up at the door. He heard I'd gotten a book deal and had come over to celebrate. I told him to come in, but that he'd better sit down. We explained to him what had happened, and he listened to the whole thing without saying a word. When we'd finished, he looked at me and asked, Was it the right choice? I said it was absolutely the right choice. Well then, he said, you need to get your rear back to Los Angeles and go get the right deal. I said that was indeed my plan, and as soon as we could figure out how to actually keep everything turned on and stapled together so I could afford to go back, I would. He looked at me and asked how much money I'd turned down. I told him the number. He pulled out his checkbook, and he wrote me a check for that exact amount and handed it to me. You're making the right choices, he said as he got up to leave, and you always have. Now you go do what you need to do, because your friends have got your back. We believe in you, and we're not going to let you fall. And he left. As I stood there holding the check, I realized I was looking at the culmination of my choices. His father was the banker who had given me my first business loan when I was 16 years old. Now, almost two decades later, his son realized I was still following the path I'd chosen long ago, and that I just needed some help along the way. If you make that hard choice to do what you believe in most, people find ways to help you. The decision I made on that drive from Los Angeles involved a choice, the most important choice I make about everything on a daily basis, the most important lesson I teach in person or in my books, the one lesson I hope you remember. Never, ever sacrifice what you want the most for what you want the most at that moment. What I had wanted most at that moment was a hamburger. What I had wanted the most was the right publishing deal, and I held out. I went back to Los Angeles, and it took another couple of months of meetings and people not doing anything, not buying anything, before finally, finally, I had that meeting. I had that meeting with someone who said, I think my boss will like what you do and his boss was the producer of the Harry Potter films. Then, some months later, my manager called and said we'd gotten a preemptive offer, which means really high, from Simon & Schuster, who wanted to publish Here There Be Dragons, in hardcover. The week the book was published, Warner Brothers optioned the rights for just under a gazillion dollars. The book is now in its eighth hardcover printing, its tenth paperback printing, and is being published in more than 22 languages. Hundreds of thousands of copies have been sold. Six sequels are following it, and the movie is being worked on by the producers of Lord of the Rings. A choice with no consequences has no value. Making a choice knowing there will be consequences and being willing to bear them is what distinguishes the right choices from the wrong ones. You've just been listening to an excerpt from the audiobook version of Drawing Out the Dragons by my dear friend, James A. Owen. And that was just a segment of talking about the choices that you make. I thought I'd leave you with that little tidbit, just sort of a post 
credit little treat for you. I'll uh, also leave a link in the show notes, but it's jamesaowen.com if you're looking to purchase this or any of his other books.